Testing, testing. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Tired. <laughs> now you're not allowed to. Well, you are. You have an excuse, right? <laughs> that can be. That that goes for a lot of different things. <laughs> I still can't believe you don't. So when's your due date? October seventh. You look great. Thank you. You look great. Yeah. It's liable that I won't look like it the whole time that we're in this class. So. I remember you were telling me that. Yes. That's yeah, I started showing, like, right away. Like, I, that's how I knew I was pregnant, is my waist expanded by two inches. <laughs> I was like, I went home and tried to put on a suit that I'd been wearing for years, and it wouldn't button. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what's happened? Yes. And it was like, that's what happened. Yes. I've actually lost 15 pounds. Oh, so. my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had morning sickness then, or no? Just not been hungry, or? It's happened with my other two. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just one of those. My mom lost 20 pounds with both me and my sister, and. I could hate your genetics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The first, with my first, the OBGYN was like, you know, you really need to be eating more. And I was like, I eat all the time. <laughs> like, I can't help it. And he's like, okay. And then uh, had a new one for my, a new OBGYN for my second daughter. And it happened again, and she's like, have you been sick a lot? I'm like, no, I just. Yeah. It's just the way, the way it manifests yeah. itself. So yeah. this time it's the same uh, doctor, and so she's like, yeah, I'm not worried about it at all. I'm like, okay. So. <laughs> well, that was, um, it's interesting when you've got the new doctors and what they worry about and don't worry about. After Nick was born, um, they measure, one of the things they do at their first baby checkup is they measure the size of their head. And he, she was really worried because he had a big head. And... Um, she measured mine, and she went, no, that's not it. And then she measured Mike's, and she went, never mind, it's genetic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. My first, we uh, we had to go down to Vanderbilt when she was one to get her head scanned because uh -huh. it was like, they do like the percentiles, and hers was always off the chart. Right, right. And so she's like, you know, one, I can understand, like maybe they're growing. She's like, but every single checkup has been at 95 or, you know, over. Mm -hmm. Um and so she's like, I don't think it's anything, but let's, just check. but let's check and see. And so when the second one was born and she had a big head, they were like, it's, it's fine. Because yeah. my husband had to do the same thing when he was a baby, yeah. was go and get his head checked. Well, and then the other thing was Nick was just a big boy. I mean, he was, you know, and sort of, he was 9 pounds, uh, 13 ounces when he was born. And so then... Um, we go to like the six week checkup or the two, I think we were at two months and he was only sleeping like two and a half or three hours at a time. And mm -hmm. so I was exhausted and um, I was feeling guilty because I had been putting just a little bit of cereal in his formula to try to get him to sleep. And that he went from two and a half to three hours to sleep in six hours at a time. Yeah. And I had just done that like two days before we went to see the OBGYN or not the, the pediatrician. And anyway, she was like, so, you know, we don't normally like to do that when they're this little, but she said, you know, how much have you been, how much has he been drinking? And so I'm like, okay. So I start adding up in my head how many bottles a day he's taking. And he's taking eight, eight ounce bottles a day. So he's doing 64 ounces of formula a day. And she's like, oh my word. Yes. <laughs> she's like, yeah. that child is starving to death. She said, here's what we're going to do. She said, if he's ready for solids, we're going to put him on. As soon as we did that, he started sleeping like eight hours a night. I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> See, now they'll, like, when my youngest was three months old, they started telling me to put rice in her bottle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with my oldest, it was at six months. They're like, no, no rice until six months. And I'm like. <sighs> I know, it about to kill you. It did, but then I was so tired. And I was like, I need to sleep. Yeah, and I always, the first night we gave my oldest rice in her bottle, she slept all night, and I, I was know, up I every like, two hours checking on her, yeah. I was like, what's going on? She shouldn't be, but after that, it was like, oh, okay, she's going to sleep through the night, and I can sleep, and we're good. Yeah, but. life can come back to some kind yes. of normalcy, right? Yes. Well, the first time, and everybody does it different. Like, I have a best friend from high school, and she, um, her approach is that she never wanted her kids to feel like they weren't in her opinion that they weren't loved and so she wanted them if they were uncomfortable at night they could just come sleep in their bed and Mike and I are like that is not happening so um, <laughs> so at 
three months of age, we, we, we so because it's what my mom did, right? So she, so I called her and she's like, you need to just put him down for the night. And she said he'll get it figured out. We put him down for the night and he cried and cried and cried. And after 15 minutes, I called my mom and I was crying. I'm like, he's crying. And she's like. It's okay. And so she talked to me for the next 15 minutes, and he finally went to sleep. And the next night he cried for 20 minutes, and the next night he cried for 10 minutes, and then the next night he just went to sleep, right? Yes. But it's the parents that have to be conditioned through that, you know, not the kids. So yes. But my best friend from high school, she's got four kids, and she was always like, you know, they are never going to feel like, she's, and she's very much like I am. Everybody has to do it what works for them, but she's like, yes. for, for her. And so they've always had kids in and out of their bed all the time, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to no. So just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My mom, see, Ryan, my husband, his parents are like that. Like, just, oh, yeah, they can come sleep in our bed. And I'm like, from day one, I was like, no, they're not getting in our bed. Started, oh, my gosh. So yes. You have to go through all of that. You yes. know, everybody's got to be in tears and, you know, all of that stuff. You know, yes. So, but, anyway. But, yeah, from day one, both of my kids have slept in their own bed. And if they get up in the night, like, I'll go comfort them in their bed. Right. And right. they go back to sleep, and we have not had a bit of problems. But my cousin is a co-sleeper, uh-huh. and her daughter is seven and still sleeps in the bed with them. And yeah, I'm like, like no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I sleep in the middle of my bed, so, like, it doesn't, like, if I have, like, my friends from home, they'll come and stay in my apartment. I'm like, well, I mean, I guess one of you can stay in my bed. <laughs> I'm like a queen. I said, I know, but I sleep in the middle, so. Yeah. It's like, it's like, you can tell. I sleep in the middle, like, even with the mattress bag. Like, so I, like, sometimes I'm starting to, like, try and, like, sleep on one side, so I, like, even it out. But. Yes. I, I was, so, my best friend from high school is one of 12 kids, right? And so, um, so her life is very different than mine. Like, I loved going to her house because there's always something going on. I mean, there was always, like, when we were, she's the, she was the 11th of 12, mm-hmm. and when we were in high school, she already had 36 nieces and nephews, yes. right? Oh my gosh. And so there's more than 60 nieces and nephews in that family now, right? And so, but in my house, it was just me and my brother. And so she loved coming to my house because it was just us and there was nobody there. And I loved going to her house because there was always something going on. So it was, it was always a good thing. <laughs> But you were talking about how you sleep, Miranda. She's somebody, she always slept with her sister, and her always had to share a bedroom, right? And so if you'd sleep with her, like, she would go all over you, like, you know, like an arm or a leg. And I'd be like, you know, get off. <laughs> like, you're used to your own space, you I'm know? the only girl, so I've always gotten, like, I had to share a room with my baby brother. Because our rooms, like, in our old house, our rooms were across from the parents. So, like, I had a bunk bed, and then he had his crib. So every time he cried... I learned to sleep really well. Like, I can sleep through anything now because he was just bawling his eyes out. And, and you were like, go, it's not my deal, right? You know, like, <laughs> I'm like, why am I in this room? Like, how did I get the short end of the stick here? But And now it's like, you're the only girl. So I get my own room and bathroom, so I'm not yeah. really mad about it. <laughs> Should we pause it so the online people don't? <laughs> oh, I thought it was. I'll delete all that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't care start the recording now so <laughs> my bad no no Julie you missed because uh, we we recorded about eight minutes of oh. very personal conversations <laughs> about children and pregnancies oh. and, <laughs> so we're going to delete that eight minutes so that that our online folks don't have to actually go through that um, but what I was saying is you should kind of starting to be feel like the class is slowing down a little bit right we're coming to the end of the, the semester here and I structured it that way in, intentionally I, um, I wanted us to work um, you know, I feel like you needed to do the goal along with the project so that the project made more sense. So we needed to get that out of the way early on. Um, and so here for the last uh, few weeks, we're just going to cover chapters 8 and 9. And you're going to have an exam over chapters 8 and 9. So we covered chapters 6 and 7 just for reference on Tuesday. And then um, your project is going to be due, um, and we'll do final project reviews. But you're working on your presentations as we go along, so that should be no big deal when we come into finals week, right? So um, I think that that should kind of, again, we're sloping off into the, the end of the semester here, which feels good to me too, by the way. Um, so, um, so chapter eight, uh, today we're going to j- just do some conceptual uh, pieces to kind of set up the homework that we're going to work on. And then what I thought I'd do is afterwards, if you uh, would stay until I have a chance to go over the projects with each of you, um, and I think that'll probably only take me five or ten minutes per group. And so, um, and 
And generally speaking, we have kind of one issue that goes across all groups, and so I'm just going to address that. I didn't really take off any points for it because, A, it went across all groups, and so I feel like there's probably some clarification that I need to do. But, B, it is something that I want to make sure that we address and that you understand that particular issue. So um, I'll talk about that generally speaking, and then it'll just take me a few minutes to kind of go through projects individually, and you should be then good to go to make your revisions to see to get them up to date. And then uh, next week I'll talk about D and kind of what's in, what we need to be focused on for Part D and having you finish that up. Okay. But today we're going to talking uh, talk about managing flow variability or what's called safety capacity. Okay. And um, again, it's just a kind of a conceptual. Let's get the um, sorry. It's I'm trying to get it to. It's really slow today. Our computer is slow today. Um, so they give a, an example from L.L. Bean, um, and I honestly, I didn't go back and, I usually go back and review the example, but if I remember it correctly, it's a customer service example <clears throat> where they have actually um, incoming lines that they do customer service on, and basically they don't have enough capacity, and so they're turning people away, and they don't even necessarily realize they're turning people away. And I think that's, I think I talked to you a little bit about the spreadsheet that we've got that goes along with this chapter. And that's what I think is cool about this spreadsheet is if you know your processing rate and how many servers you have and your arrival rate of your customers, it's going to help you estimate how many customers you might, you're not serving because they're not able to get in, right? And other than this statistical approach, how are you ever going to know that if they call and they get a busy signal? you don't have any way to tally who's getting a busy signal, right? And so that's kind of what this uh, process is about. So our previous assumption is a product that we supply can be produced and inventoried in advance. So we've been dealing with inventories, right? Um, in cases like L.L. Bean and the Financial Aid Office, which is a project that we've done in the past, right? That's not a valid assumption. If you have a question about financial aid and it's during that, that first week of classes, you know, you may not be able to get in. Right? And that was one of the things we were able to show them is how many students were actually getting a busy signal during their peak time periods. Right? And so again, if you don't do this calculation, they don't have any way of knowing how many students aren't actually getting through. And so, um, so as an example of some of the suggestions that we made is, well, is there a way that we can communicate answers to some of the most common questions? And so what they did is they created a website that has here's the most common questions to try to cut down on the number of students that have to call so that that and then uh, when you um, when you get the on hold part of it it actually tells you I think you know go you can go to this website for, for further information and Troy I was going to say that's one of the things I thought you know um, so Troy's project is about stocking and one of the interruptions that you get is common or customers commonly interrupt with questions, and because you're focused on customer service, right, you don't want to not answer those questions. So it's not like when you talk about how do we eliminate or reduce the amount of interruptions people get when they're stocking. So some, one of the things that I uh, would, would recommend for you is to think about, and there may not be, but are there common questions that customers ask, and if there are, is there some other way we can communicate that so that they don't have to ask that question, right? And the only way to know that is to talk to the people who are doing it and what are the questions that they're getting and then try But it's that getting to the root cause of why are they having to stop and interrupt. And sometimes, right, in that situation, it just is. And so, and that's fine. You know, that's, that's what your help's there for, too. But so that's part of it. You know, how can we look at what some of those interruptions are and, and reduce those? Okay. <clears throat> so I know this is a surprise, right? Business processes are defined by inputs, outputs, buffers, and resources. You've not heard that ever before in this class, right? Um, and our key operational performance measures are flow rate, flow time, and inventory. Okay. So previous chapters, we studied the role of inventory in matching supply with demand and make-to-stock decisions. In this chapter, we talk about make-to-order operations or primarily service operations. Okay. And, the, and why I focus on service operations, and I think it's probably probably coming back down, but at one point of all of the um, operations in the United States, 
we were up to over 80 to 85 percent service operations, right? And we were not manufacturing much. So, um, you know, if we just went around the room, Blake, yours is a manufacturing project. Khaled, yours is a serve. Well, it's a it's a retail, right? It's it's the Marie Donuts. Um, Chelsea, you're a service operation. You guys are doing HR, which is a service operation. You've got kind of a production with the rowing, right? And you've got kind of a retail. So we're probably, you know, 60, 70% kind of service oriented. So I didn't spend a ton of time on the inventory because most of your projects are going to be related more to the service side of things, okay? Um, <clears throat> But if you need that inventory for reference, right, we've gone over Chapter 6 and 7, and we can dive into that for, for information, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, again, we're going to be talking about make-to-order or service operations. And so our language changes just a little bit, okay? So when we talk about service processes, okay, we have customer arrivals is a term that we're going to use, and that's the inflow of job orders, right? The server is going to be the resource unit that processes a customer arrival, and a queue is the inventory of inflow units that accumulate in the input buffer because we don't have enough processing capacity. And for me, the visual that I think is the easiest to use is if you use the bank, right? So when you walk into the bank, the teller is your server, right? And the customers arriving, okay, customer arrivals, and however many are waiting to see a teller, that's your queue. Okay. Those that are actually with the teller are not in the queue, but those that are waiting to see the teller are in the queue. Okay. <clears throat> and people wait because, sorry, I'm hoping you didn't have a chance to read that. Think about if you go to Walmart. Okay. How many of you uh, go to Walmart and look at the register lines? So let's say this is before you could self-checkout. Okay. So because we always do self-checkout now, but let's say before you could do self-checkout. You go and you look at the lines. What are the? There's usually two things that you're looking for. Do you know what the two things you're looking for to decide which line you're going to go to? How long the line is. That's the that's the first one. <clears throat> how many items they have? How many? Okay. How many items they have? Okay, that's good. I hadn't thought of that one. Okay, there's a third one then. <laughs> like, if it's a store that you go to regularly. The actual the server, person. the or the. The yeah, person that's out. actually scanning person. it, right? Because you know how quick they are. Right? And so basically what we say about um, <coughs> the service process is that we have a couple of things that are variable, right? We have a variability in how in the arrival times of customers, okay? Meaning like maybe I'm gonna get six customers at once or maybe I'm gonna only have two, or there's a variability in processing times, right? And so those processing times are that how fast they actually check you out. Right? There's a couple of people at Walmart that I just won't go to. Right? <laughs> it's not happening ever again. In particular, it's the guy that picks up every item I have and announces out loud what it is. Right? <laughs> like I really that that's that. There's a couple of problems with that. It slows the process way down, and I don't really care for him to tell everybody else exactly what I'm buying every time. Right? Okay. So then. <clears throat> um, and, and when we think about this variability in processing times, if you think about as you're making things to a particular order versus if you're making things to stock, which has more variability, the make to order or make to stock? Order. Right, because it changes every time, right? Not, maybe not every time, but close to every time. Make to stock is that consistency. So we're going to have more variability in this, okay? And I always use the example of my grandmother and myself going to the bank, right? So when my grandmother goes to the bank, here's the other variability that comes into play. As a customer, when I had small children, I wanted to get in and out. I don't want to chit chat because I'm worried that my children are going to have a meltdown, right? And so just let me come in, let me go out, and I'm happy, right? And my grandmother lived alone, right? And she wanted to go in and she wanted that kind of warm, fuzzy, let's visit, make me feel like you love me experience, right? And that's exaggeration, but, but truthfully. So we're very different, you get very different types of customers too, okay? All right. <clears throat> So if you're the process manager, you need to balance that cost of reducing the variability and the cost of increasing process capacity, okay? Um, so we're only going to consider a single activity process, and each customer is processed by a single server, okay? We're going to keep it relatively simple. And so we talk about that as a single phase service process, okay? You could have multiple servers, but they're all performing the same set of activities 
on one customer at a time. So the example that I want to use there, um, think about, you can meet, but they can have a single queue or a multiple queue. The easiest example there, um, so think about Wendy's and McDonald's. When you go into Wendy's, what happens when you get in line? There's one line. There's one line, right? And you get in, and even if they have two registers, you're in one line and you just go to the next available, right? But when you go to McDonald's, and I don't know if you can see, I haven't been inside to the new one. But when you go to McDonald's, I used to hate it because I'd go in and I'd be like, are you in line? You know, are you in line? You know, who's still like that? Still yeah. like that? Yeah, and that's a multiple queue, right? Some of them are set up better than that, but again, that's the multiple queue approach, okay? So, so you, and it's, and it's Walmart when you pick a, a register, right? You have to go pick a particular register to get in line for. And you can see um, another example is that Books A Million up in Paducah is that same, they have that single queue. Like you get in line and they may have five registers open and they just holler at you when you get to the next one. And of course they kind of like that. There's a, there's a strategy for that too because they put all the things that your kids would want, right? And so that they try to get you to buy those last minute things. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And so another term that we talk about is a service order discipline. Okay. So how are you going to serve the customers that you've got? A lot of times we do first come, first serve, right? You get in line first, we're going to serve you first. Okay. Sometimes you might break it apart by the complexity, right? And you might take the easiest ones down one server and the harder ones over here. So the easiest ones are going bing, 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 and moving right through the service, and the harder ones, they have to wait a little bit longer. Okay. Um, in this section, we're going to assume that all customer arrivals can be accompanied, accommodated by the input buffer and eventually served, meaning we have enough capacity. Okay? Section 8.7 is the one that addresses if we have to turn customers away. Okay? <coughs> so in our single phase service process, we have customers that arrive, okay? they wait for service, and then they're processed. Okay? Now is where we get into the language part of it. Right? And I don't know why, but the first year or two I taught this, I had a hard time getting my head around this, and it's really not that hard. So, but again, if it's new to you, it may, may feel harder. But if you think about what we're saying, customers arrive, R sub I is what we call the average inflow rate. So think about it as the throughput of the customers, right? What's the average inflow rate? So that is measured in customers per time, right? And then the inverse of that, so then I go time per customer, is what we call inner arrival time. So how much time exists between each customer arriving. So you can be in a problem given one or the other, and you're going to know the, the opposite because they're just the inverse of each other, right? But you have to make sure that you understand the unit of measure that you're dealing with, okay? So the average inflow rate is customers per time, and the inner arrival rate is time between customers, okay? <clears throat> All right, and then we have um, we have some measures of time. I'm sure you're surprised when we have measures of inventory throughput and flow time. I know that you know you're going to be <laughs> never heard that before. But T sub T stands for the service processing time. So that's the average time that's required to serve a customer. Okay. So in a single phase service process, the process time is equal to the activity time. Okay, which is equal to the unit load in Chapter Five. Right? So we're kind of tying some things together here. And then if we want to talk about the unit service rate, again, it's the inverse of the processing time. And so we're going to talk about how many customers per unit of time. Okay. All right, now we have a new variable. Small c represents how many servers we have all together. So if I'm at Wendy's and there's two servers at there's two cash registers with two servers, my C is going to be equal to two. If I'm at Walmart and I have five cash registers going, I have five. Okay? So the number of customers that can be processed at one time, right? So that's going to be the scale of the operation. Okay? R sub P, the service rate or process capacity. So how fast can we, um, the maximum rate at which customers can be processed by all servers in the server pool. Okay? And how we calculate R sub P is that we take the number of servers we have and we divide them by the processing time. So let's think about that for a minute. So if my servers are two and my processing time is one minute, right, that means that I can serve two customers a minute, right? Okay. 
And you can interpret that as just the scale of the operation times the speed of the operation. Right? How many servers do we have and how fast can they actually process someone? <clears throat> okay, again, we can discuss that in terms of flow rate, flow time, and inventory. Flow rate measures the process capacity. Okay? And so our rate or our throughput is equal to the average rate that customers flow through the process. Here's the, the thing about a service is that throughput is determined by whichever is smaller, the number of customers coming into the process or the service rate, how fast can you, right, the inflow rate or the service rate. So, um, <clears throat> and typically you're hoping that you have enough service rate to accommodate the customers. So your throughput is often the inflow rate of your customers. When we talk about capacity utilization, right, it's going to be the inflow rate. How many customers do we have arriving divided by the processing rate? How fast can we process those customers? And so if that uh, throughput rate is greater than the inflow rate, then our total processing capacity can meet the demand for service. And if that's the case, if our processing rate can meet the demand for service, then our throughput rate has to be equal to the inflow of, of our customers. <coughs> so then therefore, our uh, utilization is then the inflow rate divided by the processing rate. And that's going to be less than one so that we can um, so that we can use, so that we've got that available capacity is unutilized, okay? And that's essential for a stable service process. When utilization is greater than one, now it's like the university bookstore when people are returning books between 10 and 2 on two or three days of the, at the end of the semester, right? The line just grows infinitely, okay? <coughs> All right. So in a service, then, our safety capacity comes through excess processing capacity or supply availability to pr process the customer arrivals, okay? So our throughput for uh, sub S is equal to your safety capacity, and it's going to be your processing rate, right, minus your, your, your throughput. And in this case, we, in a stable process, we've said that's the rate that customers arrive. So... Generally speaking, you're going to get these relationships, but what you don't get is sometimes tying them back to what each of these um, variables mean. So just spend a little bit of time kind of reviewing that and make sure that you, you get comfortable with what those variables mean. Because we have a lot in this particular chapter, and that's why that's all we're going to kind of go over today is that terminology. Okay? So we have flow time measures. Okay? And if you think about, let's start at the bottom of this slide. Our total time, this should make common sense, if you think about the bank, it's going to going to equal the time that people wait, right, and the time that people are being processed, okay? So T sub I represents the time that people are waiting, and T sub P represents the time that they're being processed, okay? So our waiting time is the average time that a customer spends in the queue, that input, bef uh, that input buffer before they're being served. And our <clears throat> T sub P represents the service processing rate, or the average time to process a customer. And it is the theoretical flow time of a customer who does not have to wait for service. Okay? In terms of efficiency, flow time efficiency is in the proportion of time that a customer spends being served rather than waiting in the queue. Okay? So we're going to take our, that's just that proportion of, What's our activity time, T sub P, divided by the total time that they spend in the process? And again, the total time that they spend in the process is the processing time plus the waiting time, right? So again, there's just this series of relationships that we're trying to tie together. So spend a little bit of time um, going through those slides and, and just trying to make yourself comfortable with that terminology, okay? And like I said, that first time that I taught this, I, I for whatever reason, struggled to kind of make those connections. And now I look at it, and it seems relatively straightforward. So I hope it comes together quicker for you than it did for me that first time through. Okay? And so that's really, that's the terminology that I want to go over today. And then we'll start into actually looking at some, some problems then on Tuesday and Thursday, because I'd like to spend the remainder of today's time talking about the project. And so um, 
what I found almost across the board is that um, when we calculated um, Let me just make sure I say the right thing here. So you were asked to calculate the theoretical flow time of the process. Okay? And there's here's a couple of things that I want to address is when we talk about theoretical flow time, right, we also talked about um, uh, value add efficiency, right, in this particular part of the project. Um, and so there are no necessarily, um, what you've done in terms of how you calculated it isn't necessarily wrong, but it's not consistent with what we've done in the problems, okay? So what almost all of you did is you added up all of the flow time and all of the activity time, and you divided that and said that's our efficiency measure, okay? And as long as you, so you need to clarify that as one of your measures, okay, which is fine. But if we were doing it consistent with what we've done in the problems, right, you would find that critical path, and you would find then the activity time on the critical path, or the longest that set of activity times across your, the paths in your diagram, and divide it by the flow time on your critical path, right? And almost no one did that, okay? So, because if you go back to the problems that we did, we looked at specifically what's your critical path, and we took the theoretical flow time based off of um, that critical path, okay? And so that's just one adjustment that I'd like you all to go back and make. Um, and most, for some of you, that's really about the only thing that you need to kind of clarify and go back and take a look at. Um, does, that, does that make sense to you, what I'm saying? Yes. I'm getting Austin saying yes, mm -hmm. Chelsea? Okay. Because, um, and, and why I preface it with everybody's got a different way that they want to see the information. So what I don't want you to take away from this class is that there is a necessarily a right way and a wrong way, right? Um, what you did is not necessarily wrong, but when you tell someone about that efficiency, you need to define where that efficiency measure is coming from, okay? And in that same way, um, we need to be specific the efficiency measure that's consistent with what we calculated in the class is based off of the time related to the critical pass, okay? So, um, so I think let's make that correction. And it's one of the things that probably um, when I came out of school and went into my first job is you learn things from a textbook and you think that everybody's going to do them like that because you're a little bit naive when you come out of the school, right? And you're like, yeah. And then you get into the real world and you find out that not everybody does it exactly like what we talk about in the textbook, okay? And many of you have already learned that. But um, I can remember thinking I had some things figured out, and then you do, but somebody else is just doing them slightly different, and it doesn't make it wrong. It just means, and it's part of what you can bring to the table. Then you can compare what you know to how they're doing it and determine, is there is this the best way or, you know, and uh, again, it's not always wrong. Uh, I was found it interesting when I worked at Pella and Shenandoah in the custom plant. They measured um, efficiency by hours per unit, and when I went to the Proline plant, they measured it by units per hour, right? And so, in the custom plant, you were wanting lower numbers, right? And in the Proline plant, you're wanting higher numbers. And so, neither is wrong, right? But they're just two different way ways of kind of getting at productivity measures. And so, um, so again, that, that's my two cents worth for everybody. I'm going to go ahead and shut the recording off and then just going to spend a little bit of time with each, uh, with each group. And I'll probably I'll just start at the front of the room with Troy and work my way around. Okay.